Welcome everyone to our weekly reading of Prometheus Rising by Robert Anton Wilson. Prometheus Rising presents a taxonomy of consciousness with eight circuits and an implied evolutionary progression. We are reading it to explore ways to hack our consciousness for better living. I'm Bubble, also known as Alley Words. I have a bachelor's degree in philosophy, and I've worked with and written about Prometheus Rising over the past five years. Last week we read Chapter 15, Different Models and Different Muddles. If you missed it, look it up on our YouTube channel. Well, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Let's start out by looking at the exercises from Chapter 15 last week. Those are on page 238. Uh, and for those of you that are, don't already know, there are PDFs of this in various places for you to follow around, follow along. All right. Uh, the first exercise was using the four circuit model. Try to guess which specific imprints created Mr. Saxon's reality tunnel. Mr. Saxon and then Mr. White and Mr. Wilson were people who were referenced in this chapter uh, that we just read last week. Um, more interesting, if you haven't read that chapter, or maybe try to think, of, try to analyze Jesus, Hitler, Walt Whitman, and your own father and mother using this system. Um, I'll go ahead and talk about Walt Whitman a little bit. I'm not like a Walt Whitman expert or anything, but uh, parts of Leaves of Grass are can be very inspirational. For me, a lot of that book feels like the uh, neurogenetic circuit because um, a lot of it is just like awareness of all of humanity or perhaps just all of America all at once. Uh, like he sings a song of, him, of himself, but it ends up being like everything that's happening all at once. Uh, and I'm not sure what you could say about his other imprinting. He was known to be uh, very vocally bisexual. And I don't really know about what he was like as a child. So he definitely had an unusual fourth circuit imprint because he had differing ideas about morality and his own sexual practices were pretty uncommon for the time. And yeah, I'll just uh, reference the fourth exercise, which was to write a criticism of this chapter from the viewpoint of Christian fundamentalism and use that to bring up how th repeatedly throughout this book, Robert Anton Wilson is trying to get you to think about things from other people's perspectives and to not accept any one map of reality or any one way of viewing your experiences as absolutely true. Uh, even his own. All right. Let's continue with chapter 16 on page 239. It's titled The Snafu Principle. If you're able to see our projector right here, uh, we have a picture of a police officer and some a quote that says, The peculiar nature of the game makes it impossible for participants to stop the game once it is underway. Such situation we label games without end. And I'm probably going to say this these names wrong, but it's from a book called Pragmatics of Human Communication. It looks like the authors are Watzlawick, Beaven, and Jackson. All right, our next page has another image. And this one has uh, some references to uh, Nietzsche's genealogy of morality. I don't remember what chapter it was that we first spoke about that, but that was fairly early in the book. So this page says, communication is only possible between equals. And then we have a sort of dimension going between dominance and submission. Dominance is labeled Aaron morale, and submission is labeled Slav morale which is a reference to master morality and slave morality. Those are German terms. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's German um, from Nietzsche. And there's a whole lot that goes into that. But the idea is that cultures have their own uh, systems of morality and different cultures can encourage or discourage uh, different ways of thinking about yourself and other people. So on the left, we have someone, a person holding a spear saying, I'm in charge around this habitat, and then the person to the right wearing a horned hat is saying, I'm moral, he's immoral. And it says, this is second circuit neuropolitics. If you recall, the second circuit um, 
It has a lot to do with hierarchy. It's referred to as the anal territorial circuit. And there were uh, various graphs showing the dimensions for each circuit on top of each other. And the one of the pictures it's interesting. for it... interesting. It says anal because uh, it's connected to your spine, which people say holds like your energy. It's like a Tesla rack. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it sounds like you might be referencing Kundalini and Tesseracts. I will ask that uh, people not interrupt, but uh, we'll definitely stop and go for questions and comments at various points. Yeah, if you have any questions there anything else you comments, want to say about... just uh, note them down and save them for, for the breaks. We have them, so don't worry about it. We did okay. just stop here anyways, though. Yeah. Um, are there any other comments or questions about this? Uh, I'll say that anal is actually a reference to Freudian's anal uh, expulsive or uh, retensive uh, psyche and the first circuit is referred to as oral so it's that kind of dichotomy that it's referencing sorry to get it but yeah so this picture is uh, an illustration of second circuit neuropolitics and Robert Anton Wilson is hoping that humanity is going to move past that then we have a quote from Finnegan's Wake saying they shall come to no good which um, there's a lot that you can pull out of anything from Finnegan's Wake, and that one looks deceptively comprehensible. But I think there's a saying or a phrase maybe from the Bible saying they shall come to know God. And uh, without more context from Finnegan's Wake, it's kind of difficult to figure out what perhaps it originally meant. Uh, let's jump in at page 241. So it says, mammalian sociobiology, rooted in the antique neural circuits of the old brain, contains many factors opposing the evolution of domesticated primates into true freedom and objective intelligence. The chief of these reactionary factors was described in my novel Illuminatus as the snafu principle, or Selene's law. It holds that communication is only possible between equals. This was an oversimplification for fictional, satirical purposes. More precisely, this proposed law is in quotes would read adequate communication flows freely between equals communication between non-equals is warped and distorted by second circuit domination and submission rituals perpetuating communication jam and a game without end game without end is capitalized because it's a specific concept political power as a typical alpha male once said grows out of the barrel of a gun this metaphorically as well as literally true. The gun may be symbolic and fairly abstract, consisting of ritualized social expectations, don't talk back to your father, or concrete in nonviolent but deadly ways, e.g. the capacity to remove biosurvival necessities by cutting off the ticket supply in a capitalist society. One more word and I'll fire you. Under the primate circuit sociobiological rules, Everybody tends to lie a little to flatter or to evade displeasure when exchanging signals with those above them in the, in the pack hierarchy. Every authoritarian structure can be visualized as a pyramid with an eye on the top. This is the typical flowchart of any government, any corporation, any army, any bureaucracy, any mammalian pack. On each rung, participants bear a burden of nescience in relation to those above them. This is they must be very, very careful that the natural sensory activities of being conscious organisms, the acts of seeing, hearing, smelling, drawing inferences from perception, etc., are in accordance with the reality tunnel of those above them. This is absolutely vital. Pack status and job security depends on it. It is much less important, a luxury that can be easily discarded, that these perceptions be in accord with objective fact. For instance, in the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover, the agent had to develop a capacity to see godless communists everywhere. Any agent whose perceptions indicated that they were actually that there were actually very few godless communists in the country at the time would experience cognitive dissonance. His or her reality tunnel was at variance with the official reality tunnel of the pyramid. To talk about such perceptions at all would be to invite suspicions of eccentricity, intellectual wiseacring, or of being oneself a godless communist. The same would apply to a Dominican inquisitor in the Middle Ages who lacked the capacity to see witches everywhere. In such authoritarian situations, it is important to see what the top dogs, alpha males, see. 
it is inconvenient and possibly dangerous to see what is objectively happening. But this leads to an equal and opposite burden of omniscience upon those at the top, in the eye of the pyramid. All that is forbidden to those at the bottom, the conscious activities of perception and evaluation, is demanded of the power elite, the master class. They must attempt to do the seeing, hearing, smelling, etc., and all the thinking and evaluating for the whole pyramid. But a man with a gun, the power to punish, is told only what the target thinks will not cause him to pull the trigger, write to the pink slip, order the court-martial. The elite, with their burden of omniscience, face the underlings with their burden of nescience, and receive only the fact, only the feedback consistent with their own preconceived notions and reality tunnels. The burden of omniscience becomes, over time, another and more complex burden of nescience. Nobody really knows anything anymore, or if they do, they are careful to hide the facts. The burden of nescience becomes omnipresent, more and more of sensory experience becomes unspeakable. As Paul Watzlawick notes, that which is objectively repressed, unspeakable, soon becomes objectively repressed, unthinkable. Nobody likes to feel like a coward and a liar constantly. It is easier to cease to notice where the official tunnel reality differs from existential fact. Thus, snafu accelerates and rigidus, sorry, it's a sort of like a made-up word, rigiditis bureaucraticus sets in. The last stage before all brain activity ceases, and the pyramid is clinically dead as an intellectual entity. We also propose that national security is another semantic spook, an Empedoclean knot, that the search for national security is the chief cause of national insecurity and a potent anti-intelligence mechanism. As Leary writes, secrecy is the original sin, fig leaf in the Garden of Eden, the basic crime against love. The purpose of love is to receive, synthesize, and transmit energy. Communication fusion is the goal of life. Any star can tell you that. Communication is love. Secrecy, withholding the signal, hoarding, hiding, covering up the light, is motivated by shame and fear. As so often happens, the right wing is half right for the wrong reasons. They say primly, if you have done nothing wrong, you have no fear of being bugged. Exactly. But the logic goes both ways. The FBI files, CIA dossiers, White House conversations should be open to all. Let everything hang open. The government be totally visible. The last, the very good, sorry, the last, the very last people to hide their actions should be the police and the government. End quote. But my eminent colleague states so politically can be stated more functionally as follows. Every secret police agency must be monitored by an elite corps or secret police of the second order. This is because a Infiltration of the secret police for purposes of subversion will always be a prime goal of both internal subversive and hostile foreign powers. And b. Secret police agencies acquire fan fantastic capacities to blackmail and intimidate others in and out of government. Stalin executed three chiefs of the secret police in a row because of this danger. As Nixon so wistfully said in a Watergate transcript, Well, Hoover performed. He would have fought. That was the point. He would have defied a few people. He would have scared them to death. He had a file on everybody. Thus, those who employ secret police agencies must monitor them to be sure that they are not acquiring too much power. Here, a sinister, infinite regress enters the game. Any elite second order police must be also subject to infiltration or to acquiring too much power in the opinion of its masters. And so so, it, too, must be monitored by a secret police of the Third Order. In brief, once a government has N orders of secret police spying on each other, all are potentially suspect, and to be safe, a secret police of Order N plus 1 must be created, and so on forever. In practice, of course, this cannot regress to mathematical infinity, but only to the point where every citizen is spying on every other citizen, or until the funding runs out. National security in practice must always fall short of the Empedoclean infinite regress it requires for perfect security, securities in quotes, in that gap between the ideal of one nation under surveillance with wiretaps and urine tests for all, 
and the strictly limited real situation of finite resources and finite funding, there is ample encouragement for paranoias of all sorts to flourish, both among the citizens and among the police. All right, that brings us to another picture. This picture has a pyramid with an eye on the capstone saying, I wonder what's going on behind my back. I need more cops. And it's labeled the burden of omniscience, or why you can't reach the court or the castle or the castle in Kafka's allegories. I think this is an okay place to stop and summarize because um, there's a lot of stuff going on in this book. And it's kind of deviating a little bit from the typical format of the earlier chapters, because this one isn't about any one, uh, any one circuit. So this chapter is called The Snafu Principle. And uh, the basic premise is uh, this is talking about communication between equals, if you go back to the beginning, and it's saying that a uh, more accurate description of what he is trying to communicate is that adequate communication flows freely between equals. Communication between non-equals is warped and distorted by second-order domination and submission rituals, perpetuating communication jam and a game without end. Uh, what's going on as it goes further is that any sort of government in order to reliably function, ends up having some sort of intelligence agency that does not openly disclose its information and what it's watching and what it's doing. And it, this creates a power differential between those who know and those who don't know. And because of this, it's perpetuating second circuit domination and submission rituals. Unfortunately, um, if you want to maintain the status quo with an intelligence agency, you have to make sure that it doesn't get too powerful. Um, Stalin had to execute multiple um, executive officers or whatever they were because they knew too much. So because of that, you have to have a secret police watching your secret police. You have to have an intelligence agency watching your intelligence agency. But that uh, it goes on indefinitely because who's going to watch the second order secret police? Uh, this is reminiscent of Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which we spoke about in the last chapter or two, where any system you create cannot fully describe itself, because uh, in talking about itself, it kind of just creates another level. There's always something that it can't fully comprehend. And we haven't really gotten into it too much, but this is sort of uh, laying the groundwork for the last circuit, which is kind of like non-local and it's going to be talking about quantum mechanics. And the book does get a little bit uh, vague and abstract, and somewhat intentionally, as it goes on. Do we have any questions or comments now before we continue? Either, uh, can you give me like what circuit means? Uh, a circuit is a certain kind of consciousness. So the second circuit, which we've been talking about, is the anal territorial circuit and when your brain is doing things that relate to hierarchy whether you're higher or lower status than various people around you or what makes people high or low status things like that you're engaging in second circuit thinking uh, third circuit thinking has to do with symbol manipulation um, talking about things perhaps making music depending on how you approach it like, uh, it, like, if you're so good at making music, hiding stuff in it to make people feel certain ways, that like, that's the third circuit of like you can use that for good or use that for bad. Is yeah, absolutely. That? Uh, one of the chapters talks about how Beethoven was so good at using the third circuit to compose his symphonies that he was actually able to um, create symphonies that, for people who are ready for it can induce higher circuit experiences. Or this book is an example of a third circuit exercise that, um, you know, it's making up a map of reality, or at least a, a part of reality, and manipulating the symbols that are in that map to communicate things. It's a good question. 
It's a complicated question. Might also be good just to point out again, this is a a model presented by uh, Robert Anton Wilson, uh, which is based on his work and that of Timothy Leary. So, uh, you know, it uh, maybe isn't so much saying this, uh, again, is the only definite way to look at it, but it's uh, one way to look at, again, you know, different activities of uh, human brain or consciousness and personality and so on. This book's a Luminatra. Uh, he wrote a series of comedic, philosophical, conspiracy, sci-fi type stuff called the Illuminatus Trilogy. I think uh, someone told me about that yesterday in this room, but I don't think it will, maybe it's not that book. <laughs> Could yeah, be. Somebody mentioned it in right, the Discord there... was, uh, the other day as well. I haven't read his fiction before. Do you think it's an interesting bubble? Sorry if that digresses. Uh, the... Yeah, it... It does digress a little bit, uh, but I did listen to, I'm pretty sure, the whole trilogy on audiobook, and I enjoyed it. Uh, it kind of reminds me of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but mixed with conspiracy theory instead of aliens mm-hmm. and uh, Is it philosophy. Is something you can pull from where it's like you, you learn from a book as well? As well as it yes, you can definitely... If you're interested in early chaos magic and Discordianism, you can definitely learn a lot from it. Um, In the essence of time, though, we're going to continue, and maybe we can talk more about that later. All right. So we just left off. We're about to pick back up on the bottom of page 244. Uh, And it says, The USSR, after 62 years of Marxist secret police games, reached the point where the alpha males were terrified of painters and poets. In spying and hiding transactions, worry leads to more worry and suspicion leads to more suspicion. The very act of participating, however unwillingly, in the secret police game, even as victim or citizen being monitored, will eventually produce all the classical symptoms of clinical paranoia. The agent knows who he is spying on, but he never knows who is spying on him. Could it be his wife, his mistress, his secretary, the newsboy, the good humor man? If there is a secret police at all in any nation, every branch and department of government and institutions which are not even admitted to be parts of government become suspect in the eyes of cautious and intelligent people as a possible front for or tunnel to the secret police. That is, the more shrewd will recognize that something bearing the label of HEW, or even international silicon or pencil, might actually be the CIA or NSA in disguise. In such a deception network, conspiracy theories proliferate. Rumor is necessary, has been found, when people cannot find official news sources that can be trusted to tell them what is really going on. The present author, having worked in the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the legalized pot movement, and other dissident causes, has repeatedly been approached by friend A with dire warnings that friend B is almost certainly a secret police agent, only to be told later and independently by friend C that friend A is a secret police agent. It requires delicate neurological know-how to keep one's sense of humor in the secret police matrix. The more omnipresent the secret police, the more likely it is that intelligent men and women will regard the government with fear and loathing. The government, on discovering that growing numbers of citizens regard it with fear and loathing, will increase the size and powers of the secret police to protect itself. The infinite regress appears again. That brings us to another picture. Showing two people that appear to be covertly spying at each other. And one of them is even holding the book he's reading upside down. All right. And it says, suspicion leads to more suspicion. The only alternative was suggested sarcastically by by playwright Bertolt Brecht, who was hounded by U.S. secret police as a communist and by East German secret police, later as not sufficiently communist. If the government doesn't trust the people, Brecht asked innocently, why doesn't it dissolve them and elect a new people? No way has yet been invented to elect a new people, so the government will instead spy on the existing people with increased vigor. Every secret police organization is engaged in both the collective, both the collection of information and the production of misinformation, euphemistically called disinformation. That is, you score points in the secret police game by 
both hoarding signals, information units, hiding facts from competitors, and by foisting false signals, fake information units, on the other players. This creates the situation I call optimum snafu, in which every player has rational, not neurotic reasons for suspecting that each and all may be trying to deceive him, gull him, con him, dupe him, and generally misinform him. As Henry Kissinger is alleged to have said, anybody in Washington who isn't paranoid must be crazy. Maybe the UFOs really exist objectively, or maybe the whole UFO phenomenon is a cover for a secret police disinformation ploy. Maybe there are black holes where space and time implode, or maybe black holes were invented to befuddle Russian scientists and send them into little man who wasn't there semantic spookery. Maybe Jimmy Carter really exists, or maybe he is, as National Lampoon once claimed, an actor named Sidney Goldfarb, trained to project an attractive down-home image. Perhaps only three alpha males at the top of the national security pyramid really know the answers to these questions. Or perhaps these three are being deceived by certain subordinates, as Lyndon Johnson was deceived about Vietnam by the CIA. Such is, the neurologic, such is the neurosociological logic of a disinformation matrix. It is, as Paul Watzlawick has demonstrated, the logic of schizophrenia. Less than 10 years after the secret police game was established here by the National Security Act of 1948, the books of Dr. Wilhelm Reich were burned in a New York incinerator by government order. This was a, sh this was a shocking sight to some of us, remembered that we had recently fought a long war against Nazi Germany, among other things, the crime against civilization of burning books. Shortly thereafter, Dr. William Ivey, former head of a department at Chicago Medical School, was subjected to 10 years of legal harassment for espousing a radical cancer cure. More recently, Dr. Timothy Leary was sentenced to 38 years imprisonment for espousing controversial ideas about neurotransmitter chemicals and re-imprinting the nervous system. Now there is a war against holistic physicians. It does not matter whether any of these, any or all of these heretics were right or wrong. Scientific truth is only determined after a generation or more of research. It is not determined by throwing the dissenters in prison or burning their books. The point is that the secret police game immediately creates the social context for a return to the mechanisms of the Holy Inquisition. The intelligence of the whole society, the communication networks through which information is received, decoded, and transmitted, is the first casualty. I feel great, and I send fraternal greetings to Dr. Andrei Sakharov in Russia, said Dr. Leary, on emerging from prison, registering the fact that the mechanisms of the police state are the same everywhere, as are the myths that protect them. Good Russians, believed Dr. Sakharov, uh, were a, I'm sorry, the the grammatical oddity threw me off. Good Russians believed Dr. Sakharov was a half-crazed alcoholic. Good Russians believed that the doctor was a half-crazed uh, half alcoholic, just as good Americans believed that Dr. Leary was a half-crazed dope fiend. I once proposed in a magazine article that the UFO is caused by some unusual electromagnetic or gravitational field fluctuation and that this geophysical anomaly creates a real energy disturbances, jumping furniture, electrical failures, ball lightning, making odd lights in the sky, etc., and b disturbance in the brain functioning of animals and humans in the afflicted area, causing the well-documented animal panics and the rather obvious human hallucinations incurring in such areas. Statistical support for this theory will be found in Persinger and Lafreniere, who have run computer analysis of common patterns in 1,242 UFO cases and 4,818 other abnormal reports, poltergeists, teleportations, miracles, and mysteries of all sorts. This data demonstrates that both UFOs and other energy anomalies tend to cluster along earthquake faults, with some peaking before earthquakes. Persinger and Lafreniere also suggest that the geophysical forces at work create both real oddities, jumping furniture, etc., and hallucinations, so that it is a job of nice and exquisite discrimination to attempt to find out what is really going on. It has also been proposed by the learned Dr. Jacques Vallée, astronomer, cyberneticist, and physicist, that the UFO phenomenon is, is being created by a secret police agency as an elaborate cover 
for a complex disinformation system. A combined wilson persinger lafreniere uh, valet theory, probably fitting more of the data than the separate theories, would suggest that the UFO phenomenon is the synergetic production of some geophysical oddity which created weird energy fluctuations and brain change experiences in humans on the scene and is being manipulated after the fact by one or more intelligence agencies or by groups even more esoteric. Consider this scenario. Something weird happens. Assume that it is the geophysical abnormality and brain change trauma we posit, but grant also that it might be the alien spaceship beloved by folk myth. The following events are equally likely, whatever the weirdity really was. As soon as the witnesses start talking, all interested parties converge on the area. Intelligent agent Mo comes to conceal evidence that it might have been a spaceship. That is, the policy of his agency for their own reasons. Intelligence agent Joe also arrives to plant evidence that it was a spaceship. That is the policy of his agency since they are doing just what a Dr. Valet suspects. The British Double Cross Bureau in World War II engaged in equally complex and absurdist dramas seemingly totally unrelated to their actual work, but serving as disinformation screens for that work. Philip Class and other skeptics arrive too, trying to reduce everything to hallucination even if eyes are burned, cars wrecked, etc. The space freaks, who may or may not be infiltrated by associates of intelligence agent Joe, are soon there too to get the facts to fit their benign space brothers reality tunnel. Various occultists are there too to fit it all into their own mythos of angelology, demonology, and so on. What we are saying is that every conspiracy regards itself as an affinity group, men and women who share the same goals and work together well. When you and I do it, it is just an affinity group. When that gang over there does it, it is a damnable conspiracy. True conspiracy does exist when a group conceals evidence, spreads deliberate misinformation, and coerces or terrorizes witnesses. Any affinity group approaches such behavior to the extent that members reinforce each other's participation in the group reality tunnel, especially concerning such crucial epistemological matters as what is important enough to notice and discuss as against what is trivial and better ignored. How coercive do we have to be to intimidate witnesses? Most people, as our snafu principle explains, are easily led to reporting what an authority figure wants to hear. But let us consider the UFO syndrome further as illustrating the whole spectrum of brain change and brain programming. UFO contactees frequently show neurosomatic turn-on, the bliss-out experience. Some even become faith healers or leaders of occultist groups. Others show negative neurosomatic effects. Light is unbearable, as in schizophrenia, anxiety attacks, may require hospitalization, etc. Metaprogramming consciousness, the ability to choose between alternative reality tunnels, is also reported in crude metaphors about parallel universes, other realities, occultist jargon. Neurogenetic, Jungian collective unconscious visions, so neurogenetic visions, are common, ranging from demons, hairy dwarfs, etc., to the Space Brothers or the Lady of the Stars of Ancient and Celtic Iconography. Even metaphysiological, quantum-level experience is reported in UFO literature, ranging from trans-time trips and out-of-body experiences to seeming or alleged teleportations. It must be emphasized most strongly that both positive and negative visions on all these circuits are common in ufology. It seems that if the programmers mean us well, they are accidentally doing ill to many, and if they mean us ill, as Dr. Bellet thinks, they are accidentally doing well to some of us. But this is true of all brain change technology. It seems that Bellet's monistic conspiracy theory is adequate, as monistic conspiracy theories are inadequate in politics. It is more likely that the UFO experience, like the other brain change experiences we have studied, are sometimes spontaneous and sometimes programmed, and that there are rival gangs of programmers with radically different goals in mind for humanity. When Dr. Leary and I published a neurological analysis of the Patty Hearst case in OUI magazine, the editors introduced it with a dramatic headline. The fight for Patty Hearst's mind is the overture to a worldwide battle for the control of consciousness. Not quite. The Hearst case would more appropriately be considered a bar near the end of the second movement of the Mind War Symphony. 
The first movement was the primitive neuroscience of ancient and medieval tyrants who acquired a great deal of, of pragmatic know-how about the effects of isolation, terror, and intimidation, and of shamans and occultists who learned how neurochemicals can alter perceived reality tunnels. The second movement began with the modern psychology of Freud, Pavlov, Jung, Skinner, etc., climaxing with the LSD revolution and the discovery by millions that reality tunnels could be radically mutated, temporarily and sometimes permanently, by neurochemistry. The third movement is the growingly obvious warfare between those who would program all of us and those who wish to become our own metaprogrammers. All right, that's the end of this chapter. It is kind of an odd one, even for this book. But it is right before chapter 17, which is on quantum evolution. The last chapters are notoriously confusing and abstract because they talk about something that is confusingly abstract, which is um, what he's calling the non-local experience. Before we go back and summarize the chapter, are there any questions or comments? I mean, I just put something together, like how you're saying, like, cops are watching cops or people are watching people and it keeps going back and back because it always needs like when you have security the only thing that's gonna happen is like it's gonna progress you need more security more security there's no going less if you choose to go down the security route and then like i was thinking is that why they're building a master computer because it wouldn't be a human watching anyone it would be something watching someone so that <laughs> loop might, might be broken and that loop might not even exist anymore if there was a massive That's interesting thought. On people. that is an interesting thought i don't think it um philosophically resolves the issue because uh one of the big issues with ai ethics especially when it comes to using ai to make policy decisions is that we don't really understand how the ai works so we don't understand why it's making the decisions it makes. Um, and the so people in power that... probably don't even want that because that doesn't even give them any chance. If uh, maybe. I think over. realistically, if that were to happen... Uh, well, uh, the first point is that already, uh, at least since... I know that it was an issue in Vietnam where it, there are artificial intelligence that is that are used to make especially military decisions where they program models and have AI run different scenarios with different starting conditions in order to guide their decisions. So we do already have artificial intelligence, at least since like the 80s, being used uh, to guide those decisions. But uh, even if we were to publicly have artificial intelligence making um, like social decisions for whatever country, um, you would need people to interpret it, and I would expect that you would create an artificial intelligence to analyze the neural, net neural networks in the AI that you're using, assuming that it's programmed with neural networks. And then it creates the whole who watches the watchmen kind of right. issue. Yeah, so you get AIs um, spying yeah. on AIs and, and so on. It starts all over again. Yeah, that is how a lot of yeah. them are trained as they learn from each other mm -hmm. or themselves. If you're interested in a novel that is about like spies watching spies watching spies that fits in with the uh, kind of vibe of Robert Anton Wilson, um, what is it? Through a Scanner Darkly? By, I like uh, how this Philip is like a very straightforward right. way to put it. Like it's very understandable for that concept of like for someone to understand, oh, uh, like, yeah, um, surveillance state or or surveillance world yeah or even peer pressure in yeah certain absolutely ways, right yeah and so on i mean those were examples too started off with that he kind of went on with the, um, the secret agencies kind of thing but uh, you know in essence it applies to so much uh, you know All right. how don't you dare step no. outside of the common reality tunnel you know it's better if you don't see things for the way they really are because uh, well you might get people who think hey this this dude is a little weird you know he's not uh he's not like us you know um yeah sadly with a lot of mainstream kind of uh, uh trends i suppose you know this uh this does have an, a very direct influence on a lot of people's lives 
especially young people. Yeah, and yeah. of course, um, with the increasing self-documentation of people's lives, uh, AIs are being trained to watch people and analyze people, and not just to like recommend them ads, but in order to radicalize them, to be targeted with bots in order to put subtle propaganda into their feeds. Um, Facebook, it is known, will purposely test to see if they can induce particular emotions in people um, based on sure. the, the kinds of things they show them. Uh, so yeah, it is a, a real issue that's progressed since the writing of this book. Yeah, like at this point, there's no more no, no difference anymore between, you know, uh, giving a specific emoji reaction. You know, it, it, you feel like you're just communicating something to another person, but really you're giving Facebook uh, feedback about, you know, your, your mental processes down to the flavor of emotion you're experiencing. So that is, is pretty interesting and creepy, yeah. Yeah, Very a lot great. of it is actually um, how long you spend looking at certain um, items. You'll notice a lot of uh, social media, they purposely only show you one thing on the screen at a time because it's easier for them to narrow down like what you're looking at right. to figure out how you're reacting to it just by based on like button pushes. But we're going on more tangents. <laughs> but uh, Yeah, I do okay. have another question about this. Um, uh, maybe if you want to save it for later, that's all right too. But do you know if Robert Anton Wilson lived to see like the NSA disclosures and that kind of stuff and what his reaction was to it? Uh, I don't. Uh, I actually don't know a huge amount about Robert Anton Wilson as a person. Right. Uh, I might look that up. It could up. be That's interesting right. to look into him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know he died between 2000 and 2010. Right. Yeah. So that is way before that, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Snowden was like 2013. I don't know. Let's go ahead and summarize this chapter real quick. It's a pretty short chapter. So this chapter is called The Snafu Principle, and uh, the basic premise is that information flow in terms of how people are observing each other creates uh, sort of like power differentials, and depending on how that's done, it can create sort of an infinite regress is what he's calling, where you have like people who are storing information about other people, about other people, about other people, and it kind of just goes on forever. And he talks about uh, a burden of omniscience and a burden of nescience, um, where the people who are at the very top, it is their duty, in a certain sense, if they're actually going to do a good job, to like know basically everything so they can make informed decisions. However, uh, in order to maintain pack hierarchy, if you're not very far up, uh, it, there are some things, let's try to keep our mics muted, there are some things that it is better for you not to know. Uh, and that is illustrated by Stalin having to execute a number of officials who, in the course of their duty, just acquired more knowledge than perhaps they should have. All right. Uh, Paul Watzlewick notes that uh, that which is objectively repressed, unspeakable, soon becomes subjectively repressed, unthinkable. So there's that connection between thought and language again, which is uh, kind of like third circuit thinking. Nobody likes to feel like a coward and a liar constantly. It becomes easier to cease to notice where the official tunnel reality differs from existential fact. So this is kind of getting at uh, the ways that culture as a whole is able to brainwash or mentally program specific individuals without any one person having to do it. Uh, and it mentions there that this principle accelerates until the entity that is doing the observation uh, just becomes rigid as it's constantly having to see and not see everything all at once. Uh, that kind of there and not thereness that it's getting at, uh, that built-in contradiction kind of relates to earlier ideas about quantum mechanics with electrons being in multiple places at once, which is uh, tied up in our next circuit we're going to talk about. Uh, and that really was the core of the chapter. 
and we talked a little bit about that in our comments afterwards that uh, if you have like a, a an information state so to so to speak uh, it it becomes Empedoclean. There's the knot of Empedocles, which was just so complicated that the only way to untie it was actually to uh, strike it with a sword. I believe it was Alexander the Great who did that, uh, mythically speaking. Uh, there was a knot that these sages had that, yeah, we don't need to go down that rabbit hole, but it's interesting that he uses that word specifically multiple times, and to me that makes it sound like he's implying that in order to resolve the issues that come about with a um, surveillance state, you kind of have to cut it apart. You have to stop playing that game because that game perpetuates itself indefinitely and presumably to the point of death. Um, and that is basically it. There was a, a good picture that illustrates this that we still have up on the screen. Suspicion leads to more suspicion. It kind of just goes back and forth and back and forth. Uh, and then there's a lot of disinformation discussion about UFOs. Uh, and that there are just many people that are trying... There is some sort of phenomenon happening that he's calling the UFO phenomenon, but then there are many people who are trying to manipulate the way that information is perceived. Uh, there's a saying or a phrase that he uses <clears throat> a few times, there are rival gangs of programmers with radically different goals in mind for humanity. So there are groups of people who are attempting to alter the collective consciousness through various tools and practices and techniques. And we mentioned a little bit of that with the way social media and artificial intelligence are being uh, weaponized at the moment. But it can just be as simple as starting like a subculture or the way political groups influence each other as well. And then he gives a little summary of those rival gangs of programmers. He says the first movement so like the first way that people started engaging with that kind of thought, trying to control their neurogenetic destiny, trying to control the gene pool as a single entity, uh, was the primitive neuroscience of ancient and medieval tyrants. So like kings and dictators and warlords who acquired a lot of knowledge about how to control people using isolation, terror, and intimidation. But then also shamans and occultists who learned how neurochemicals can alter perceived reality tunnels, so they learned various brain change techniques. The second movement began with modern psychology, so Freud, Pavlov, Jung, and Skinner, as well as others, uh, developed, I guess, more like secular, although not entirely secular, techniques for analyzing and controlling, uh, hopefully for good, the psyches of individuals, but as specific psychological techniques spread throughout a culture, it has a broad impact. So psychoanalysis didn't just impact the individuals that Freud analyzed. Uh, the perhaps brief popularity of psychoanalysis as an actual clinical tool influenced the movement of cultures as a whole. And then he says that, that second movement climaxed with the LSD revolution and the discovery by millions that reality tunnels could be radically mutated temporarily and sometimes permanently by neurochemistry. So uh, the widespread realization that various chemicals can induce these higher circuit experiences and re-imprint you. Although, of course, that was uh, known for a very long time by cultures that have used uh, various entheogens, as I'm going to call them, since prehistory. And then, of course, there is our... Um, it almost goes without saying at this point, just because a drug is brought up by Robert Anton Wilson, that's not an endorsement of it, it's just a historical fact, and perhaps a tool for communicating about different kinds of consciousness. And then he says, the third movement is the growingly obvious warfare between those who would program all of us and those who wish to become our own metaprogrammers. So I'm interpreting here that he views himself as someone who is trying to get people to activate their sixth circuit consciousness and learn how to reprogram themselves and that his desire is for as many people as possible oh did i call it six uh timothy leary and robert anton wilson flip-flopped the sixth and seventh circuit i have a tendency to think of metaprogramming as the sixth circuit but uh in this book 
I'm just going to double check at the table of contents. Robert Anton Wilson has it as the seventh circuit. And uh, there are varying arguments about which one it should be, but honestly, the order in the higher circuits doesn't matter all that much, in my opinion. All right. Uh, and then, of course, there are people that want to control culture and therefore the collective entity that is humanity and also the biosphere uh, more precisely. All right, let's take a look at the exercises. So we have seven exercises this time. Really First great. one says, <laughs> start collecting evidence that your phone is bugged. And I want to put out a disclaimer here that like, if you're already paranoid, maybe don't engage too completely in this. Uh, because it's definitely possible to give yourself panic attacks or anxiety or paranoia. But uh, start collecting evidence that your phone is bugged. Two, everybody gets a letter occasionally that is slightly damaged. Assume that somebody is opening your mail and clumsily resealing it. Three, look around for evidence that your coworkers or neighbors think you're a bit queer and are planning to have you committed to a mental hospital. Four, try living a whole week with the program Everybody like me, sorry, everybody likes me and tries to help me achieve all of my goals. Five, try living a whole month with the program. I have chosen to be aware of this particular reality. Six, try living a day with the program. I am God playing at being a human being. I created every reality I notice. Assume that the God is the answer to DeFree John's question, who is the one who is living you now? Seven, try living forever with the meta program. Everything works out more perfectly than I plan it. All right, those are interesting exercises, but of course, if you are thinking about this book, it should be very clear that there are uh, potentially harmful or unhealthy things that you can imprint yourself or reality tunnels that you can enter, and that it may be a learning experience to do that, but it is not the degree to which you enter such experiences uh, can matter. So don't go too far off the deep end. Yeah, I think All it's right. pretty clear from the any... exercises that he's uh, suggesting, you know, you do it for a short moment or um, however long the exercise takes, uh, but then you let it go again. And he doesn't even go into, you know, whether there should be any actuality to what, what you're trying to look for, you know, like whether or not somebody's tapping, you know, it's just you assume it, and that's the exercise. So it's by no means a yeah. suggestion to live the rest of your life with uh, <laughs> those particular ideas in mind, you know, they are risky things. Unless uh, you like it. Sure. Uh, well, you know, we can sometimes be misled by what we think we like and so on, but that's maybe a different discussion. Uh, but yeah, there's just that's fair warning. Point. It's it's uh it's spicy stuff. That's you know? a, a he, very good way to put it because <laughs> I I didn't think about that and I was like oh yeah. Well, it's just just to say that raw gives us some really cool stuff to play around it, but it's definitely spicy, you know. And uh, um, yeah, for it's, sure, it's, like it's, any book or information. Yeah. And that's and that and like people get used to reading so much a day that even them might forget sometimes to be fully aware of what you're reading. It's just like, like what do you call it? Free reading. It's like speaking in tongues where you speak off like nothing. Free thought. Which is not... Uh, the people say <laughs> the same thing with meditation. Like, if you go into meditation the same way, you can be affected by energies that um you don't want if you don't set, like, boundaries beforehand or do some something beforehand. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are definitely... I'm not going to go on tangents about that, but yeah. Um, the, if you don't set any boundaries, uh, you you don't know what's going to happen. All right. Well, it's been a good session, everyone. All right. Thanks for coming to today's session. The recording will be up on YouTube, and you can join us again next week, same day and time. Follow what I do outside of VR chat over at my link tree. That's linktree slash elephant words. L-A-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash elephant words. 
If you haven't already joined the VRM Discord, we have a URL in the lobby. Consider supporting VRM by donating, supporting on Patreon, or becoming a volunteer. More information at vrmystery.school support. This is the end of today's session, but feel free to mingle in the lounge.